Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Today's discussion is in the Teaching the Rabbi's Playlist and is entitled Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, addendum number 6. So here's another comment I got to the initial video from an at A6705. Leviticus 2646, these are the laws, rules, and instructions, the Hebrew word, which I can't pronounce, plural, multiple, the written Torah and the oral Torah, which is all the laws. Did you know that without the rabbis to explain the vowels in Hebrew, even the Christian Bibles wouldn't be understood? Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 10 to 11. You shall carry out the verdict that is announced to you from that place that God chose, observing scrupulously to all their instructions to you. You shall act in accordance with the instructions given to you and the ruling handed down to you. You must not deviate from the verdict that they announced to you, either to the left or to the right. This is regarding all laws, as Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 8 states. This is about the rabbis in every generation who can give rulings for us to follow. Now, the Talmud was written in the year 500 AD, approximately. So, let's look at this. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 46. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Now, notice it's by the hand of Moses, so it's not talking about oral Torah. It's talking about written laws, isn't it? By the hand. All right, let's look at Leviticus 26, starting at verse 1 through 7 here. Ye shall make no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary, I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and you shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. And you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. All these promises, if they follow the commandments of Lord God. Continuing verses 8 through 13. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. And ye shall eat old store, and bring forth the old because of the new. And I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that ye should not be their bondmen, and I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright. Continuing verses 14 to 20. But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but ye that but that ye, excuse me, break my covenant, I will also do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies, that they that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if ye will not, Yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. So notice if the Hebrews, the Israelites, do not follow the commandments of God, notice the curse upon them. Continue verses 21 to 22. And if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. Verses 23 to 26. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins. So notice this repetition of seven times. Remember, seven is a number of completeness, perfection. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when you are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. 
verses 27 to 33. And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. And ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. I will not smell the savior of your sweet odors. And I will bring the land into desolation. Your enemies, which dwell therein, shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you. And your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Continuing verses 34 through 39 here. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it. And upon them that are left alive of you, I will send a fatness into their hearts in the lands of their enemies, a faintness, forgive me, and the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them, and they shall flee as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when none pursueth. And they shall fall one upon another, as it were before a sword when none pursueth, and ye shall have no power to stand before your enemies. And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. Continuing verses 40 through 45. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespass against, trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham, will I remember, and I will remember the land. The land also shall be left to them, and shall enjoy her Sabbath, while she lieth desolate without them." And they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity, because even because they despise my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will, for their sakes, remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt, in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God, I am the Lord." Now let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 17. We have verses 8 through 13 here. If there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment, between blood and blood, between plea and plea, and between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within thy gates, then shalt thou arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt come unto the priests, the Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days, and inquire, and they shall show thee the sentence of judgment. And thou shalt do according to the sentence, which they of that place which the Lord shall choose shall show thee, and thou shalt observe to do according to all that they inform thee, according to the sentence of the law which they shall teach thee, and according to the judgment which they shall tell thee, thou shalt do. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee to the right hand nor to the left. And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest that stand to minister there before the Lord thy God or unto the judge, even that man shall die, and thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. And all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. Continuing with our friend's comment. However, everything in the Talmud is oral tradition. Everything in the Talmud from the 5th century AD is oral tradition, passed down from father to son and teacher to student. From what I recall, I don't think, speaking as guests of Christians, you keep the Sabbath according to its laws. Well, even in the uh, laws of Moses, right? The Gentiles who sojourned among the children of Israel had to follow certain rules, but didn't have to follow all the rules of the children of Israel, including Sabbath, including circumcision, etc. I don't think you put on tefillin, phylacteries, etc., etc. I didn't see that mentioned in anything we read there about tefillin and phylacteries. Even though the Torah states these are eternal covenants. Now, surely God does not forget. Certainly, God knew what he wrote the Torah, the future, and that Jesus would exist. Why does the Torah not state, you shall keep the Sabbath until a man by the name Jesus shall come? It is entirely possible that the New Testament be false, but it is impossible, according to Christians, for the Old Testament to be false. Right? right. No, nothing in Holy Scripture is false. Again, there were certain rules given to different groups of people. The rules given to the children of Israel were for the children of Israel. 
And again, the purpose of Israel was to give us Lord Jesus Christ. And the purpose of Lord Jesus Christ was to reconcile the entire world back to God. All of us are made in the image of God. God is not a respecter of persons. Okay, my reply. Lord God established the old covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob Israel so that the divine Messiah could one day enter creation through that particular human lineage. Otherwise, Lord God is not a respecter of persons, as I just mentioned. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. Your interpretation of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 17 is quite short-sighted. Lord God also promised that a son of David would always sit on the throne, but this ended with the first destruction of Jerusalem and Solomon's temple by Nebuchadnezzar. What happened? Likewise, Lord God promised the Levitical priests would continuously perform animal sacrifices, but this ended with the second destruction of Jerusalem and the second temple by the Romans. Again, what happened? FYI, these promises are explicitly expressed in Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 17 to 18. So let's look at those verses. This is Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. And here's uh, Jeremiah chapter 33. We're going to look at verses 14 through 18. Behold, the day shall come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. You mean the divine Messiah entering creation? Yes. In those days, and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. That's Lord Jesus Christ. And he, Lord Jesus Christ, shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Now remember when Lord Jesus returns on his second advent, then he's going to do judgment and install the millennial reign, which does appear to involve, you know, physical descendants of uh, Israel. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. But that ended with the destruction of Jerusalem the first time and the temple the first time. Neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. Right? That's a promise of Lord God. And that ended with the second sacking of Jerusalem by the Romans and the destruction of the second temple um, in uh, 70 AD. And notice branch in verse 15 is Sema. Hebrew Strong's 6780. Where else do we see branch? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem or the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And a branch is wet netzer, Hebrew Strong's 5342, different Hebrew word. When a ser, one occurrence, there it is. And it's derived from netzer, Hebrew Strong's 5342, a sprout, a shoot, a branch, netzer. Netzer, consonants N-Z-R, Netzer. Hmm. Matthew chapter 2, verse 23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, consonants N-Z-R, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. He shall be called a Netzer. He shall be called the branch. John chapter 19, verse 19. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus the Netzer, Jesus the branch, the king of the Jews. Isaiah chapter 9. Hmm. Who's this branch? Two chapters earlier, verses 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Il Gabor, only used in Isaiah chapter 10 to refer to Lord God of hosts, the everlasting father, or the father of eternity, or the source of eternal life, the prince of peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. Oh, this must be that man that's going to sit on the throne of David forever to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So this man is what going to be immortal? He's going to always sit on this throne, this divine Messiah here, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7. And peace in verse 7, ule salom, like shalom, right? Uh, Hebrew Strong 79, 65. 
what happened was the divine Messiah entered creation. This was explicitly prophesied in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10 to 11, and Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. The entire purpose of the Old Covenant was to set the stage for the later arrival of the divine Messiah. Everything in the Hebrew Bible points to Lord Jesus, yod heh vav heh, in the flesh, the divine Messiah. Second Temple Judaism converted into Christianity from the time Lord Jesus walked the earth. The false religion you follow is not Judaism, but rather Talmudism, a 5th century AD Messiah rejecting cult, as our friend even mentioned. You are just like those spiritually blind Hebrews Isaiah was sent to in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. You see and hear, but don't perceive nor understand. You are just like those first century AD Judeans who rejected the divine Messiah when he walked in their midst and called for him to be physically killed, prophesied explicitly in Isaiah chapter 53. I pray one day you repent of the false religion you currently follow and come to the feet of Lord Jesus, Yod Heh in the flesh, the Son of God, explicitly mentioned in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, the divine Messiah, my Lord and my God and your Lord and your God. So let's look at this. Genesis chapter 49, verses 10 through 12 here. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Again, these are the blessings that Israel's giving to his 12 sons, and he gets to the fourth son, Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter is what a king would carry, right? So the kingdom shall not depart from Judah. Oh, what does that mean? The kingdom will depart from Judah at some point, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Well, when Jerusalem was sacked the first time by the Babylonians and the uh, first temple was destroyed, the kingship was taken away, right? And there were seven years in captivity and then the, uh, 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 the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem and rebuilt the city, right? And they never had a king, their own king ruled over them, but they had self-rulership, right? Under the Babylonians, under the Medo-Persians, under the Greco-Macedonians, and under the Ro Romans. So the scepter shall not depart from Judah, right? refers to the kingdom which was taken away when Jerusalem was sacked the first time and the first temple was destroyed. And then there was a lawgiver, but that was taken away when the second temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was sacked by the Romans in AD 70. Hey, that's right around the time of Lord Jesus, who we're taught was crucified around AD 33, until Shiloh come. Wait, wait, hold on a second. That just says Shiloh and the ancient rabbis interpreted that shallow peace as the King Messiah. So the King Messiah was going to come right around that time after the kingdom was taken away and after self-rule was taken away. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be the people of the world. Again, the Bible's not written for Hebrews and Jews. The Bible is written for the world. Reconciliation is between God and all image bearers, all mankind. So this King Messiah, this Shiloh, who was going to come after the kingdom was taken away and right around the time self-rule was taken away, right? Binding his foal unto the vine and his ass is colt unto the choice vine, right? That refers to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 12, and obviously the triumphal entry of Lord Jesus into Jerusalem in the New Testament. He washed his garments in wine, his clothes in the blood of grapes. That's a reference to the fact that he's going to be killed. Look, his, his clothes are covered in blood, right? His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Not sure of this, but what I believe this refers to is the book of Revelation because his eyes are like a flaming fire, his eyes red with wine, and out of his mouth proceeds a two-edged sword. I think that's the reference, oh, it's a sort of truth, by the way, uh, reference to his teeth being white with milk. And then Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 25. Seventy weeks are determined, okay? I'm not going to get into this too much, but in the Old Testament you see this several times. One day would represent one year, right? The 40, uh, excuse me, the 12 spies were sent into Canaan and they remained there 40 days, right? And the um, Israelites listened to the 10 spies and not the two, um, Joshua and Caleb. And because of that, they were punished and they had to wander the desert 40 years, one year per day. So one day represents a year. So therefore 70 weeks, if you do the math, would represent 490 years. So this is talking about a 490-year period of time, and this is, again, during the captivity when Daniel was in Babylon. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, right, the Jews, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, to pay attention, finish the transgression. The transgression, what's that? Going back to Genesis chapter 3 and the serpent. To make an end of sins, again, Genesis chapter 3. To make reconciliation for iniquity, right, reconciliation between us and God because of what happened at the garden, Genesis 3 and to bring in everlasting righteousness. 
So everlasting righteousness is going to be brought in. And to seal up the vision and prophecies, so the whole purpose of the Old Testament, all the vision, all the revelation, all the prophecies is going to be sealed up 490 years subsequent to that point and to anoint the most holy. Now you could say, oh, there must be the holy of holies, the most holy place. But you're going to see here that at the end of this period, the second temple is going to be destroyed. So anointing the most holy means destroying it. No, it represents anointing God. Because again, reference to the divine Messiah, the Messiah, the anointed one. So who's going to be? He's going to be the God man. Because no man could do this. It's a God man. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, right? So there's going to be a future commandment, you know, and it's debatable, you know, which Persian king was it under. But there's going to be a, a commandment by one of these Persian kings coming up to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, right? Messiah Nagid, right? Shall be seven weeks, 49 years, and three score and two weeks. That'd be 62 times seven years, right? So notice it doesn't say 69 weeks. It doesn't say three score and nine weeks. So it appears there's going to be a seven-week period, a 49-year period, and then some sort of break in time of some undetermined amount of time. And then this 62 times seven-year period, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now, it's interesting. So notice it's 49 years and then a separation, 49 years. And they are talking about the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So you could say, hey, I wonder how long it took to rebuild Jerusalem in the temple. New Testament, John chapter 2, verse 20. This is when Lord Jesus told the Jews, you know, tear down this temple, referring to the temple of his body, and I will rebuild it in three days. And they thought he was talking about the physical temple. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Think that's coincidence? So I'm pretty sure that the seven weeks is 49 years, and that's how long it took them to rebuild the temple. And you have the reference to it right there in the New Testament, John chapter 2, verse 20. Continue. Verses 26 to 27. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Cut off, killed, but not for himself. He's always going to be killed for others. And the people of the prince that shall come, the prince is the Nagid. So the prince that shall come is the Messiah that shall come, the prince Messiah. So the people of the prince Messiah that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the Jews, the people of Jerusalem, are going to destroy their own city and destroy their own sanctuary. How did that happen? Well, they rejected Lord Jesus, and they didn't know the time of their coming. And as you saw in the promises of Lord God, when you do what I want you to do, good things happen. And when you don't do what I want you to do, like when, I, when you reject my son, right? When you reject the son of God, you reject the person of God, the son of God who took on flesh, you're going to get punished. And that punishment continues to this day. Uh, and the end, therefore, shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he, the Prince Messiah, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There's that final week. So notice there's seven weeks, 49 years, probably when the temple was rebuilt, then an undetermined period of time, then a 62 times seven year period of time, and at the end of it, the Prince Messiah, right, will be killed, right? And that's what happened to Lord Jesus when he was crucified by the Romans. And then again, a separation of time, and then this final week, seven-year period. In the midst of the week, in the middle of that final seven-year period of time, he, the Prince Messiah, shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Well, hold on a second. But he was killed. What does that tell you? He, he, he wasn't, he was killed, but he wasn't killed, right? And you see the same sort of concept, I'm not going to show it, in Isaiah 53, where he's killed, but then, but then he seems to be alive again subsequently. And of course, Lord Jesus resurrected himself, right? He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Oh, there's the second temple being destroyed. So obviously the, the Holy of Holies wasn't anointed. Unless you, How wicked is that? The Holy of Holies is anointed by it being destroyed. No, the most holy is Lord Jesus, the God man. And you even see that in um, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, when he's referred to as the mighty God. And for the overspreading of abominations, he, the Prince Messiah, the divine Messiah, right, shall make it desolate, right? What's going to be desolate? Well, Jerusalem and the second temple, even until the consummation. So that second temple will, will be desolate until the consummation, until end times. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And you see in uh, the promises of Lord God what will be determined. If you do wrong, you will be punished. And what can be more wrong than rejecting of the divine Messiah, rejecting the seed of David, or son of David, forgive me, rejecting the you know prophet like Moses, rejecting the seed of the woman um, and the son of David, seed of Abraham, right? And notice this, it's one week. In the middle of the week, 
is when Jerusalem's going to be destroyed and the second temple's going to be destroyed. Isn't it interesting that the first Roman-Jewish war lasted seven years exactly, 67 to 73 AD, and in the very middle of 70 AD is when the temple is destroyed. You think that's coincidence because it's not. Notice, again, the prophecy. So when's the Prince Messiah going to come? When's the Shiloh going to come? When's the King Messiah going to come? Right around the time when Lord Jesus was going to come, and it even describes all of it, him being covered in the blood of grapes, Right, him humbly entering Jerusalem as he did on Palm Sunday, him being cut off, uh, but not for himself, etc., etc. It's all right there. Now you can see why I say all based on the Old Testament. Obviously, Talmudism is completely false. The Messiah already came. His name is Lord Jesus Christ. He's your Messiah. He's my Messiah. Bend the knee now, because you will bend the knee later. Now, you can say, no, no, this can't be. Because we're Jews, you know, we're, we're, we call ourselves Jews, right? We're Jews, and this is Hebrew, and we, we know this better than anyone. How dare you, uh, you Gentile, tell us what the Old Testament teaches? Oh, really? Here's Isaiah chapter 6. This is Lord God appearing in the second temple to the prophet, sending him out to his people, to the Hebrews, to the people of Judah, the people of the northern kingdom of Israel. And he said, this is Lord God speaking to Isaiah, go and tell this people, these Hebrews, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. So they're going to hear, but not understand. Obviously speaking spiritually. And see indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people. So the Hebrews are going to have a fat heart. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy. The Hebrews are going to have heavy ears. Shut their eyes. The Hebrews are going to have shut eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Right? So if they do see with their eyes, hear with their ears, they're going to understand with their heart and convert and be healed and go back to Lord God. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. Again, is this referring to end times? And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. So you can look at this and say, wow, I, I, I would think God wants everyone to come to knowledge of the truth. Well, God does want everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth, but God knows the nature of men. And God knows there are certain people that will refuse the truth, even if it's presented them right in their face. You know, sometimes you'll have atheists bring this up, you know, why didn't Lord Jesus come down with lightning bolts shooting, shooting out of his fingers, right? Declaring himself. Well, he's, he's humble and et cetera. He's not going to do that. But part of the reason is he wants you to love him, to trust him, and make the choice. He doesn't want to force you to love him. He doesn't want to make you terrified like another quote-unquote Abrahamic faith being spread by the sword, like believe in God the way we say we're going to cut your throat. No, that's, that's wicked and that's evil. And if there's ever been a person who claims to be a Christian who did that, like maybe during the Spanish Inquisition, that's wicked and evil, right? Basically, we spread the gospel message. And if people reject it, we throw the dust off our, our, our shoes and we move on to the next uh, group of individuals to spread the gospel, to spread the good news of Lord Jesus destroying death, Lord Jesus destroying sin, as you even saw there spoken of in Daniel chapter 9. So the issue is, Lord God knows the nature of man. He created man, right? He knows people are going to reject the truth even if it's right in their face. So what he does is he gives them an excuse. He makes it that they have to kind of see through something to really, and they have to really want to know God, really want to love God, really want to trust God, be completely willing to throw away their biases and presuppositions, being completely willing to unlearn falsehood if they've been taught falsehood in the past, right? To understand and love the true God. So basically this is God's mercy here. You know, to, to make people have an excuse to say, oh, yeah, it wasn't my fault. I, I didn't see that. I didn't understand that. So that's why it's not completely in your face. But notice the truth's right there if you're willing to see it. And what's funny is notice what we brought up there, especially regarding uh, Genesis 49 and Daniel chapter 9. And I guarantee you there's going to be individuals who are going to just deny that and refuse that. And they're blind. And you see that today in the world, don't you? You see obvious truths and obvious falsehood. And people, what are they doing? They're, they're running to the falsehood. And I think it's all spiritual, right? If you have the Holy Spirit, what's that? It's a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind and not a spirit of fear. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're going to be motivated by rational fear. You see that today in this world, don't you? You're not going to have a true spirit of power, and that's why you're going to try to hurt other people. That's why you see these people using their power to hurt other people. Um, you're not going to have a spirit of true love, and you're going to have this bizarro love. And you're obviously not going to have a sound mind and you're going to believe this lunacy. And here's the other thing. Lord Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So if you love Lord Jesus, you love truth. If you hate Lord Jesus, even if you don't recognize that you hate him, 
right? Guess what you're going to do? You're going to hate truth and you're going to love lies. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? That's Lord God, obviously. What is his name? Lord God, yod heh vav And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? So what does that say? Lord God has a son. Um, if Lord God is the father, and he's always been the father, therefore this son's always been the son, but that would mean there's two eternal persons, but there's only one God, and again, this supports the concept of the multipersonal nature of God, the Trinity right there. And again, they're going to deny this. What are they going to say? Oh, his son's name is, yeah, that's Israel. Yeah, I don't think so. And by the way, Israel means he who struggles with God, right? We're supposed to be Israel, right? We're supposed to struggle not against God, with God, against our sinful flesh and against the sin within this world. And Lord Jesus is the Israel, right? He came, the, the, sec, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal divine son who took on flesh, right? To struggle as God, with God, on the earth, and he's still struggling. Now let's look at this. Getting back to the whole idea of the, the destruction of the temples. This is on, no, it's Chabad.org. This is a rabbinic Judaism, Talmudism site, right? Chabad.org. These are the reasons the temples are destroyed, the classic reasons regarding the first temple. The Talmud teaches us, or tells us, due to what reason was the first temple destroyed? It was destroyed because three matters exist in the first temple, idol worship, forbidden sexual relations, and bloodshed, okay? The Talmud then continues regarding the second temple. However, in the second temple period, the people were engaged in Torah study, observances of mitzvahs, the acts of kindness. So why was the second temple destroyed? It was destroyed due to the fact that there was baseless hatred during that period. This comes to teach you that the sin of baseless hatred is equivalent to the three severe transgressions, idol worship, forbidden sexual relations, and bloodshed. Baseless hatred. Hmm. John chapter 15, verses 22 to 25. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for the sin, right? He is the truth. He showed me the truth and they reject it. He that hateth me, without cause obviously, hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works, which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen me, excuse me, seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. <laughs> so obviously the New Testament explains this. The baseless hatred was against Lord Jesus. And the Talmud even teaches that. But again, being blind, spiritually blind, they can't see the real reason. And here it is, Psalm 69, verse 4. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. So I pray that was edifying to you. And whether you're a Trinitarian Christian such as myself or an open-minded individual who hopefully can see what we've talked about, notice Daniel chapter 9. Genesis chapter 49, time the divine Messiah who will be killed but not for himself and somehow be resurrected. I mean, you have the, the seven years of the first Roman Jewish war. You have the timing of the destruction of the temple, right? Uh, you saw the divine son explicitly mentioned in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. It's pretty obvious. So I pray if you have an open mind, right, you have an open heart, you have open eyes, you can see this truth. And you can come to the feet of Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Messiah, yod heh vav in the flesh, as I mentioned, my Lord and my God, and your Lord and your God, and the Lord and God of every human being on the earth, including those individuals who call themselves Jews. I pray they see this, and by the way, I'm not showing it, in the book of Revelation, right, in chapter 20, in the end times, many of them will come back to the feet of Lord Jesus Christ, because Lord God never forgets his promises. And his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob continues, but they have to come back to him, and they will at that time. One final point. It's again, yashanet.com. This is again, a Talmudic uh, site. So this is from the Talmud, Yoma 39a to 39b. I'll read the whole thing, but the important part is on the bottom there in the bold. 
The most pertinent portions of these passages are shown in bold. The grayed out section just below has no bearing on this discussion, but I'm going to read it anyway. Our rabbis taught, in the year in which Simeon the righteous died, he foretold them that he would die. They said, whence do you know that? He replied, on every day of atonement, an old man dressed in white, wrapped in white, would join me, entering the Holy of Holies and leaving it with me. But today, I was joined by an old man dressed in black, wrapped in black, who entered but did not leave with me. After the festival of Sukkoth, he was sick for seven days and then died. His brethren that year, the priest forbore to mention the ineffable name in pronouncing the priestly blessing. Now pay attention to this. Our rabbis taught during the last 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the second temple, destroyed in A.D. 70. So the last 40 years would mean starting around A.D. 30, which was right around when Lord Jesus was crucified. Um, before the destruction of the temple, the lot for the Lord did not come up in the right hand, nor did the crimson-colored strap become white, nor did the westernmost light shine, and the doors of the Hekau would open by themselves. So these were all miraculous signs that would happen prior to that point, right? When this crimson solid strap, right, blood colored would become white, right? Sin was forgiven, right? This lot came up in the right hand. Again, the western moon light would shine, right? These were these signs that Lord God accepted the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. Notice all of that disappeared in AD 30. Huh, what happened then? Lord Jesus was crucified. <laughs> Right? And what does the New Testament teach? That the veil of the temple, which separated the Holy of Holies right, from the remainder of the temple, was torn from top to bottom. Lord God, the presence, the special presence of Lord God, left that building right there in the Talmud. And I'll finish it. Until our Jonathan ben Zakal rebuked them, saying, Hekal, hey, Hekal, why wilt thou not be the alarmer thyself? I know about thee that thou wilt be destroyed for Zechariah. Ben Ido has already prophesied concerning this. They knew they were going to be destroyed. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. So you think that's coincidence? This is in the Talmud, which states again, forgive the repetition, starting in the year A.D. 30, basically starting upon the crucifixion of Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrifice was no longer accepted. Because you know why? Because the sacrifice was already given. All of those sacrifices of animals were foreshadowing for the sacrifice of the lamb slain at the foundation of the world. You can even see this going back to Genesis chapter 2, or excuse, forgive me, Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham takes Isaac up to sacrifice him. And Isaac says, where's the lamb, father? And what does Abraham respond in verse 8? He says, the Lord himself will provide a lamb. And then, of course, the angel of the Lord appears and says, don't sacrifice your son. I know that you love me and I know that you trust me and a ram is sacrificed. So notice, what does that mean? The lamb that was gonna be sacrificed, right? And notice it's in, the, in this human sacrifice, right? Would happen later. And when that lamb was finally sacrificed, what happened? There was reconciliation of iniquity. All of that stuff brought in everlasting righteousness. All of that stuff we saw throughout the Old Testament actually happened at that point. So it's there if you wanna see it. And I pray that you do. Amen.